want to thank you for attending today's webinar on uh, professional liability insurance for PMA members, IRS managers. Before we get started, I'd like to thank PMA and especially Tom Berger and, and Betsy Falakor for continually working with us to help us in our effort to educate IRS managers about their professional and financial liability exposures. Uh, so a little bit of information about myself. I'm a former federal employee. In fact, I'm a former Treasury employee. I was an attorney for a Treasury Department agency uh, for many years. And then I worked in private practice where I defended federal officials at a variety of different agencies for many years. These seminars typically take um, about an hour and a half, but we created this abbreviated version because we realize you don't have that much time in your day to give up. So I have a lot of material to get through in 15 or so um, minutes and a lot of slides. So I'm going to ask everybody to hold their questions until the end, and then I promise I'll stay on as, as long as necessary to make sure we get all the questions answered. So this first slide I want to start with and to emphasize a very important point, that Congress has passed legislation requiring all managers and supervisors, requiring agencies to reimburse all managers and supervisors and law enforcement officers up to one half the cost of the annual premium for liability insurance. So all of you IRS managers, uh, PMA members, you're all eligible for the reimbursement. This is important for you to appreciate and understand, not only does it save you money, but it really highlights the official support of liability insurance demonstrated by Congress and their understanding that they know there are risks associated with your federal employment that cannot completely be cured with legislation. I should also mention that liability insurance is available to all federal employees. So if we have um, people on the webinar today who may not technically be a manager or a supervisor, it's still available to you. You're just not eligible uh, for the reimbursement. This slide shows the three main areas that professional liability insurance covers, civil lawsuits, administrative disciplinary matters, and criminal investigations. So in a nutshell, the liability insurance provides legal defense for these matters and also provides indemnity protection. That's your financial liability. And as all of you know, in the, with the continuing implementation and in the wake of the IRS Restructuring and Reform Act of 1998 and the hearings in 1997 and the creation of TIGDA and you know, some other laws such as the No Fear Act, you know, the constant unfounded accusations from Congress and members of the public about IRS mismanagement. All of these things together have really resulted in increased scrutiny being placed on career IRS managers and employees. And this increased scrutiny makes you vulnerable to investigations, proposed disciplinary actions, and maybe even civil suits or criminal investigations. We're going to start with civil. These civil suits are often referred to as Bivens actions, constitutional torts, personal capacity or individual capacity lawsuits. And they involve some very complicated legal principles. Uh, but this isn't law school. I'm not going to go into those in any great depth. For purposes of today's discussion, all you need to understand is that if you are sued in your personal capacity, you can be denied DOJ, Department of Justice, representation, even if you're clearly within the scope of your employment, and also you can be held liable, even if DOJ represents you and there is a judgment entered against you. You do not have absolute immunity for these personal capacity lawsuits like you do for lawsuits under the Federal Tort Claims Act. So the Fed's policy, what does it do? It appoints an attorney to defend in these personal capacity lawsuits when DOJ exercises its discretion not to defend you in the lawsuit. When does that happen? That most often happens if you were being investigated for some sort of wrongdoing for the very same reason that you were being sued 
you can see that the Department of Justice will not want to be on both sides of that. They will determine that it is not in the interest of the United States to represent you, which is the standard. The Fed's policy may also appoint what we call coverage counsel to either monitor DOJ's defense of you, or if DOJ is on the fence as to whether it will defend, we may hire coverage counsel to convince DOJ that it is in the interest of the United States to defend you and provide the defense. And finally, the Fed's policy provides indemnification, as I mentioned, up to one million or two million to pay any judgment should there be a judgment entered against you and the agency will not indemnify you. Here are some real world examples. I don't have time to really um, get into them in, in any great detail. Um, the first one I'll mention, uh, the, the manager who is being sued personally for firing an employee during his probationary period. This is the Library of Congress case uh, that's going on and essentially the manager fired a probationary employee who happened to be a retired military prosecutor from Guantanamo Bay and he was doing a lot of speaking out against the administration's policies down at Guantanamo Bay. The Library of Congress told him to stop. He still did it. They felt it was a violation of their their information, release of information policy. So they, filed, they fired him in his probationary period, where, as you know, there's very limited rights. The district court judge in this case allowed the case to go personally through against the manager, who was simply doing his job, on, you know, probably on the vice of, of human resources, employee labor relations, or his own management. And these others are some other real-world examples you can just take a look at. So just to recap civil, um, all you need to know is you can be sued, you can be denied representation, and you can be liable for a judgment for something arising out of you performing your job, rendering a professional service. And the policy protects you in these three major ways. It provides a legal defense, it may appoint coverage counsel, and most importantly, it pays damages if there is a judgment entered against you. A final point I would like to make clear here before we leave civil is that civil suits without Department of Justice representation are rare, okay, with actual liability being even rare, probably less than 5% of the cases. So nevertheless, it can and does happen, so no matter what the percentages are, why would you risk it for $135 a year, which is what all the insurance costs after the reimbursement? Why would you risk being one of the ones that slipped through the cracks? Moreover, the real bang for your buck, uh, the real value of the policy uh, is these other protections and provisions that we're going to get into now. So in addition to the civil protections, the Fed's policy will pay for a legal defense up to $200,000 for any administrative matter or investigation that could result in a personnel action against you. This is any administrative investigation, whether it's TIGDA, OSC, the Office of Special Counsel, Congressional, an HR-directed investigation, somebody files an EEO complaint against you. Whatever you know, the matter will be, the Fed's policy will appoint you an attorney, what I call cradle to grave, from the beginning of the investigation all the way through to the completion and the unfortunate event that there's a disciplinary action entered against you, the Fed's policy will provide a defense both at the agency level and if it has to be appealed to the MSPB, it also provides for that type of defense as well. Uh, these investigations are proposed disciplinary actions that can result from really any allegation of wrongdoing involving the performance of your official duties. Think of No Fear Act investigations, think of a UNAX allegation, any 1203 or 1204 allegation or investigation, and unauthorized disclosure under 6103, 
you know, a complaint of wrongdoing made by a taxpayer or other members of the public. Often, you know, there's a lot of contractors working in your workforce now, what we call a blended workforce, and we're starting to see an increase in complaints filed by contractors against IRS managers as well. Any allegation of wrongdoing involving the performance of your duties, you're going to be covered by, by the Fed's policies. And, you know, allegations of wrongdoing are simply the cost of doing business these days. They can be made by anyone, including members of, as I remember, public, your subordinates, other employees. And whether it's true or false, the IRS is required to determine the validity of the allegations, which is going to begin with an investigation. You know how the old saying goes, you know, the grand jury, a grand jury would indict a ham sandwich. I've often said TIGDA would investigate a ham sandwich. You know, they see that's part of their responsibility. And speaking of TIGDA, um, this guy is supposed to be a, a TIGDA agent. Um, and, uh, you know, TIGDA, as you well know, is your IG in the IRS. And while most IGs focus primarily on fraud, waste, and abuse, TIGDA's mission is a little bit more extensive. You know, it came out of the Restructuring Act in the late 90s. So they have the statutory responsibility to protect the integrity of tax administration and, and to protect the ability of the IRS to collect revenue for the federal government. So to accomplish this, TIGDA you know, investigates allegations of criminal violations, it's an IG, and administrative misconduct by IRS employees. And I can tell you in recent years, according to a recent study in 2009, over 50% of the TIGDA investigations involve the alleged employee misconduct. So it's important for an IG investigation that you understand your rights. Not every request for an interview is, is mandatory, compelled, like we like to say. Often they are voluntary, and submitting to a voluntary interview is also a waiver of your Fifth Amendment rights, which you should never do without, without consulting with an attorney, attorney first. Often I hear people say, look, I didn't do anything wrong. If I just go in there and explain my side of the story to them, they'll, you know, surely they'll understand and I'll be cleared. Or if I show up with a lawyer or I quote lawyer up, they're going to think I'm guilty. Okay? People who have those points of view typically do not fare well in these TIGDA investigations. I often wonder if TIGDA, you know, appreciates that they can clear a federal official of any wrongdoing you know, and see that as part of their job as well. I have seen a trend that they really want to make any kind of case that they can against the federal official, you know, even if it involves going above and beyond what the initial allegations are. That's not to say that their role in the IRS is not important um, or that all TIGDA agents are doing that. Their role is very important, you know, and, you know, certainly there's a vast majority of TIGDA agents, you know, do their job, you know, appropriately, ethically, and responsibly, respecting the rights of federal employees, is that there are, you know, several offices out there, you know, that really target managers, you know, and the and the higher the manager, the more they start clawing at their desk. Quickly, want to mention Office of Special Counsel investigations. Uh, they investigate whistleblower reprisal, other prohibited personnel practices. You have a right to a lawyer during these investigations. The Fed's policy will give you a lawyer. It's important to get your own independent legal advice. Congressional inquiries are another type of investigations that you could be subjected to. You know, and again, IRS employees are subjected to constant and often unfounded accusations from Congress members of the public about IRS mismanagement. It's, you know, it's the old, you know, the old whipping boy here, as we say, inside the Beltway, you know, for Congress often. So, you know, and often these allegations, you know, are made against the career employee. And it's the career employee who is sometimes being served up by the politicals to go answer these questions up on Capitol Hill. And that's some scary stuff. So you definitely want to make sure you have your own legal counsel if that happens to you, and the Fed's policy will provide coverage there for you as well. EEO complaints. 
somebody files an EEO complaint against you as a manager, um, yes, it's a complaint against the agency, really, and not you personally. You can't be held personally liable, but you can be disciplined if ultimately there is a finding that some discrimination occurred or finding that some other wrongdoing has happened. Um, no Fear Act type investigations. So it's important, particularly at the initial stages during the investigation, that you obtain your own legal advice to ensure that you know what you're putting down on the affidavit is going to be consistent with the agency's position. The agency has lawyers, yes, they defend the EEO case, but their duty of loyalty is to the agency, okay, not you. It's always important to get your own advice. And I've often I've, I've learned that, that federal managers, IRS managers, are really unaware of what their role is in the EEO process, which is to establish legitimate non-discriminatory reason for doing whatever you did or, or did not do. You know, and, and it may be helpful to talk to your own counsel to ensure that you're making a proper record of that so that the agency can ultimately defend the case. Here are some examples of covered administrative actions. Um, I'm going to move off of this um, quickly here because we're, we're running out of time and, and let you look at these later. You get to keep the PowerPoint, obviously, because I want to get into some IRS-specific examples. Um, these are real live cases. Um, you know, these are real live cases. You know, that happened. The first bullet there you know, involved a, a function that really involved, a, you know, in a failure of IRS senior management politicals of classifying a particular contract a certain way so it had really proper oversight. And in this case, the contractor failed to deliver what they promised to do, and it had serious impact on what the agency does. I won't go into detail there. But it resulted in proposed disciplinary actions, even removal, against the two career senior IRS, you know, employees protecting, you know, the politicals. If that were you, you know, you would have to pay for your own legal defense if you didn't have the Fed's policy. The uh, the second bullet, I know it talks about law enforcement, but a 1204 violation can apply across the board. So hopefully you can see how that can apply in any situation. The third bullet involved an IRS manager who, you know, was simply trying to do something efficient for the agency and before they offered, you know, to hire somebody because they had just gone through this before and they really needed to get people on board, he had another manager go into IDRS and IDIS and check the system to see if she's been complying with the tax, you know, filing her tax returns. And as we all know, that's the UNAX violation, and those are very serious allegations. So for any of those matters, if you were a Feds matter, if you were a Feds member, excuse me, you know, the policy would help you defend against the allegations, prepare for any investigative process, attend the interview with you, TIGDA lets in lawyers in the interview and obviously defend defend the allegation. Finally, the last exposure area, and I'll run through it real real quickly, is criminal exposures. Um, you didn't come to work today to commit a crime. We get that. But what you need to know is that there's very little you can do wrong in the federal government and not also have it be a violation of Title 18, which is the criminal code. Some of the most common criminal investigations involving Federal managers usually involve an allegation of misuse of position or authority, conflict of interest where intent is not prerequisite to prove the crime, misappropriation of funds, release of Privacy Act or other statutorily protected information. As you know, 6103 has a criminal component to it as well. Um, I would like to mention here when we talk about misuse, abuse, a position of authority, you know, there's a particular former PMA member, um, Catherine Lunderville, who went through something, um, you know, very um, traumatic here, you know, with some criminal allegations against her 
and other managers, you know, in the wake of the restructuring hearings. And she's got, a, I can't have time to go into it, but she has a really good um, summary, you know, and testimonial of what she went through. And, you know, she didn't have liability insurance and what it would have meant to her if she did. Um, and that's on our website. You can get on our website, get to your IRS manager page, and have access to that. Um, another real-world criminal criminal allegation, you know, against an IRS manager. Um, IRS manager suspected a fellow employee of actual criminal wrongdoing, so they accessed an IRS um, choice point computer database to obtain information. Tigda open a computer fraud and abuse act criminal investigation against that employee so you know it can happen it can happen to even the most well-intended civil servants and when it does it's important to have your own legal counsel and the feds policy does provide that this is just a real quick recap of what the liability insurance covers the million or two million in indemnity $200,000 for administrative matters, 100000 for criminal proceedings. And you don't have to break open the piggy bank to pay for it. With your PMA discount, all of you as PMA members get a $10 discount. Uh, discount code is super secret PMA, and you can put it in in the, on, in the online enrollment process. And at the end of the day, it only costs you $130 for the $1 million policy. Uh, the $2 million is three seventy, dollars and I believe IRS is capping that reimbursement at $150. Um, the cost, well, the final thing I'll say on the cost here is the, the cost for one hour of legal service is more than the cost of the liability insurance for an entire year. You know, if any of you had to hire an attorney, for any kind of matter, you know what I'm talking about. Here's just some specific information on how you get your reimbursement at the IRS. We wanted to make sure you had this information uh, today, and you'll be able to take this with you in the PowerPoint. My final slide here, and I can't emphasize this point enough, you need to have the policy in place before the claim or allegation occurs. You can't buy insurance after your house is on fire can't get in a car accident on Monday, buy your insurance on Wednesday. It's important that you take the time to get enrolled immediately. It takes less than five minutes on our website. You can call, we can send you an enrollment form. You can call us. We'll do it over the phone. There's also payroll deduction available for those of you who want to spread the payment out over the year at $12 for the $1 million and $16 for the $2 million. So that concludes my uh, presentation today, and I'll now open it up for questions. Tony, we have no questions at this time. Excellent. I hope everybody um, has a good day, and you get on our website um, for more Tony? information. Yes. We do have a question. Sorry. Hold on just a minute. They're typing it in. Do you need to keep this insurance after you retire? You do not. That's a very good question. That's another uh, component um, of the Fed's policy that you get automatically. You get three years of coverage, 36 months of coverage. It's a defensive policy, so after you leave, the agency can't take any administrative action against you. But you can still be sued personally. So we give you for free three years of coverage, which is the standard statute of limitations for any any civil lawsuit. So you do not need to buy it into retirement. We have another question. How do you decide one million versus two million? You know, it's 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 what you think your risk is. It's the idea here is that one million, believe it or not, doesn't buy what it used to. And so, you know, people who are particularly risk adverse consider, you know, getting the two million. You know, it really, you know, I think you really need to depends upon the, the the type of job you have, 
and what a civil exposure you think you have. Remember, the 1 million versus 2 million specifically applies to only the civil indemnity protection part of the policy. It does not increase the other coverage limits. It's really a personal choice. Tony, we don't have any more questions, but we didn't explain how to ask the questions. Would you like to explain? You can explain how they, how they have to type it in. Yeah. Um, if anyone has questions and they're not sure how to use the questions box, there's a little um, questions tab that you just click on the little plus sign, and there is a box that you can type in your question. Okay, we do have another question now. Can I get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation? Yes. <laughs> and in fact, we will, um, I know, I think we'll be emailing out um, a copy of the, uh, a copy of the webinar and the PowerPoint presentation after uh, the webinar. And it's yours, you know, there's no, it's yours to, you know, to share with others and, and to, get information from. And I should also mention that there's a wealth of information on our website at fedsprotection.com, F-E-D-S protection.com, and we've got a specific page under about your exposures for IRS managers. Okay, we're going to invite anyone to ask us more questions at feds at fedsprotection.com. And we're going to go ahead and close the webinar at this time. Thanks, everybody.